So now we are starting um, the conference and uh, the first track, Responsive Biotextile Hybrids. Uh, and the first speaker is Jane Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that she comes from this environment, so that I will not say. Uh, but I will say something about her research. Her research is located at the intersection of textiles, architecture, and biology, exploring the potential to design with biology using textile fabrication processes. Jane's research is collaborative, collaborative and interdisciplinary. Her work in living textiles questions material and materials and construction processes in contemporary architecture. As a niche specialist, she's developing a new generation of biohybrid textile systems that operate across scales to produce low-impact alternative materials for building and manufacturing. So, please, Thank Jane. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is my mic working? Yeah. Um, so thank you very much and thank you for giving me the opportunity to give an overview of Living Textiles. Um, most of the, a lot of the projects that I've been working on are going to be presented in depth during the course of the symposium. So what I really thought um, it would be nice to do is just give you kind of a, a view into the world and how we're kind of um, looking to engage with textiles and the living. Um, and I guess as a, a point of departure, for me, my work always comes back down to the structure of materials and how structure can be used as a functional component in design, um, and really how structure can be used to transform the properties of um, fabrics, of textiles. And so the ability to, um, to apply this knowledge with... Um, sorry, I'm just going to... No, I'm not. Um, I can't see anything on the screen. I'm going to do that. Um, to think about how to translate this through biological systems up to the building scale has really um, been a great opportunity since joining Newcastle. Oh, right. So, as kind of I think we've already established this morning, textiles are situated, and I think quite uniquely, um, to operate in this um, um, domain between the biological scale and the building scale. Um, and our group believes that textiles are going to be a really key bioassembly and biofabrication strategy for this suite of new responsive and adaptive materials for the built environment. And why, um, why do I say this? Well, I think um, textiles are a really key method to work across scales. So we've got the opportunity to kind of work from that um, individual fibre across the hierarchical system, so thinking not only about um, fibre technology but also about spinning processes um, and then up into the configuration of fabrics themselves and I work principally with knitted textiles and so alongside this functional perspective you've got the programming potential of knitting and the um, incredible um, industry that supports that so if any of you can join us for our tour on Friday we've got a really uh, fantastic knit setup in the workshop so we've got one of these 3D knitting machines um, with programming capability where we can actually design down to the individual stitch. So we can really make, um, we can uh, embed all of these kind of functionalities within a fabric itself. And really this allows us to produce multiple components and even materials, with, um, even different materials within this one knitted component. So really knitting is this incredibly flexible fabrication system. And then the fascinating thing about taking this into living textiles is to think about how that can extend the hierarchy that we work with um, anyway as textile designers. So really, on the right of the screen, um, what you can see is um, kind of five fundamental components of a textile, so working from the fibre up to finishing, and kind of com composites would even go beyond that. But really what you see is that the ability um, for bringing biology into design enables us to extend both from the fibre, so at that kind of micro scale, and up into the finishing and the composite at the macro scale with, the text, with textile systems. So where I started with um, biodesign was actually to think about nature as a point of inspiration and to work with biomimicry. And really what I sought to do was to think about smart textiles, so think about how to create responsive and programmable textile systems that were very much inspired by and looked back at, at natural systems. So at natural sensing systems, at things like tropic responses, at the hierarchical structure of um, natural materials and how that produced um, responsive systems. 
and then to try and um, translate that into, into fabric design. So I was really interested in the way that plants adapted to their environment, how they um, respond to light, to, to um, water, to nutrients and the way they grow, how they're able to produce these responses through kind of um, systems within their, within their biology. Um, and I think plants are an excellent model for textile design because plants are based on um, uh, fibres, there's these multiple levels of or organisation and what it's possible to do is really to think about how those models from nature can be translated through into textiles. And so this is just um, a couple of slides to so show the work ooh, have I, um, that I, how I translated that into smart textiles. So thinking about how, um, <coughs> how the structure of the fabric itself, so thinking about how you could use natural fibres, so all the materials were composed of either wool um, or plant fibres, so European linen fibres, um, and integrate the use the structure of the fabric to produce these shape-changing responses. Um, so this was a moisture-responsive system that I developed during my PhD, um, really just to kind of um, yeah, bring the system to life, to really demonstrate how biomimicry could be used within the field of smart textiles. And at the same time, I was really interested in the potential of knit as an architectural material. And I was thinking about this from two directions. Firstly, how knit can be transformed in an architectural context. So what happens when you take a material that's conventionally understood at the scale of the body and start thinking about it at the scale of the building? But also, and possibly more interestingly, what happens to an architectural space when the spaces stop being rigid walls, confined spaces, and they start becoming soft and adaptive and responsive? Um, and obviously, there's some fascinating researchers working in this field. Um, so we've got Jenny Sabin at Cornell, Sean Olquist at Michigan, and Meta Ramsgaard-Thompson over at CETA, who are really developing some fascinating work integrating computation, um, digital fabrication through these industrial knitting technologies to, to kind of push knit into the architectural realm. And so these twin interests really came together at Newcastle um, and it's enabled me to work at the scale of the building with these kind of um, responsive properties. So there's three, t three themes within the Li Living Textiles Research Group and actually I think it kind of distills down into two perspectives. So first there's the thinking and modelling um, knit and nature so very much thinking back to biomimicry, but also thinking about how textile thinking can inform bio biotechnology strategies. Um, secondly, textiles as a scaffold for life. So here, this is about the making process. How can textile systems be engaged in um, biofabrication? And then finally, the living sensing interface. So how can we use some of these um, systems to actually produce interactive and responsive materials um, for the built environment? And really how that's distilled into these perspectives is firstly to investigate how materials, processes and textile thinking can inform biotechnology and biofabrications to enable scale up for the built environment. And then secondly, to flip that on its head and think about how biotechnology can enhance and engage with circularity and sustainability for future textiles. So what can um, biotechnology bring back to fabrics? So scale is a kind of preoccupation in my work. Um, and when we um, set up Living Textiles, we really had the scale, scale at the forefront of our thinking. Um, what scale do we need to operate to produce these functionalities in fabrics? How can we use scale to really produce adaptive and responsive materials? So we have the scale of the textiles itself, and we've talked about that, um, this kind of fibre scale, fabric scale, and yarn scale. But then how can we transcend those scales using biology? Um, and I wanted to show this uh, slide just as an example of a project that actually um, Angie's going to talk about in a second, which was a co collaboration between myself as a textile researcher and Dr. Angela Sherry, um, who's a molecular micro... I'm oh, sorry, she's not, she's a microbial ecologist. Um, but looking at the relationship between um, kind of the scale of bacteria, this is what I wanted to kind of show in this slide, acting on a textile, and then how we could use that kind of... Um, like micro scale bacteria at a macro scale within a programmable textile system. And so the idea here is that not only the, is the textile programmable to produce shape change, which means we can direct a response and a behavior in a fabric, but also that within that textile we have 
um, active b bacteria that can um, essentially enhance and be used in this example um, for remediation techniques. So it's kind of that, that ability to bring those two scales together that I think is quite unique within textiles. Um, I just wanted to highlight within this um, the work of the two PhD students linked to living textiles, who you now know very well because of this morning. Um, so Paula's work at the back is really, really builds on this idea of textiles as a set as for sensing. And so her research investigates how textiles and microbiology can be m merged to create scent emitting living textiles, really with the desire to improve human well-being within architectural spaces. Um, and you can see um, some examples of the projects that she's been working on within this research. But really, what kind of those are um, the key the key things that bring it together. And there's this multi-species centered approach, which uses de design methods very much to develop textiles that will host selective microbes and then emit scents triggered by um, human microbe interactions. In terms of modelling at a macro scale, we're also interested in extending kind of the range and the scope of textiles within the built environment. And so we do this kind of working at both a, a high tech with quite a lot of modeling techniques um, and computation, and then also at a really low tech. So taking our textiles away from our digital knitting machine and looking at what happens if we take them off, um, off machine and really scale up the materiality of textiles themselves. So how can we use knit kind of this, at this macro scale and that, this project was done um, last year, and then we've actually looked at a newer project, Modular Knitted Architecture, where we're looking at component-based systems. And this work is, um, there's a little bit of this work in the showcase, so if you want to have a little play with the script, hopefully it should be running. And then finally, I just wanted to really quickly highlight um, one other project that's thinking about scale in a slightly different way. And that's um, a, one of the prototypes that's been developed in the OM. Um, and a project that really brought together kind of a wide group of researchers at HBB, HBBE, and I was very lucky to be part of and to kind of send it in the direction of knitting, um, which was to think about how we could develop a biohybrid material um, at a large scale as a prototype. So this is, a, um, so the idea of the intention of BioKnit that was that it would be knitted using mycelium to produce um, a robust composite, but that it'd be a freestanding architectural form um, we wanted to challenge some of those um, kind of um, problems that actually Carol mentioned in her um, introduction. So actually, we've, we chose to grow BioNet on site. We took it out of the lab. We wanted to look at issues, and we're continuing actually to look at issues such as sterilisation, such as the need to um, keep all the environments clean to be using these um, biomaterials kind of at, at the building scale. Um, and yeah, and we wanted to make this form on site. So I won't go into much detail about it because we're going to talk about it tomorrow. Romy's going to present it tomorrow. But just, and I'll flick over these, this was um, really interesting looking at how biomaterials come together um, in kind of these hybrid forms. But just to kind of highlight this multi um, multitude of processes, really, that came together into the creation of this um, on-site biohybrid material. What I do want to... Um, just also highlight, and it's great because Romy is going to present um, Bionic tomorrow, is this other p the other PhD programme, um, which is developing knitted scaffolds as a key strategy for biofabrication. And what's fascinating about Romy's PhD is the different approaches to biofabrication that she's looking at when she's combining knitted textiles and, in particular, mycelium composites, and all the different elements that are required to address through, um, through this design process. And a segue into Friday, so Romy's also presenting this on Friday, so it's a great opportunity to kind of um, understand and hear a bit about more her work there. So Bionit was a really interesting prototype for HBBE, and um, we actually have had a lot of interest, a lot of things have come out of it. It was quite an interesting way to undertake a piece of research because we had a, a prototype to make um, before we could even understand the questions we needed to ask. Um, and one thing that has come for this is just a really small project um, that I'm part of called the Design Ecosystem Fellowship. And what this is seeking to do is to really go back and think about the material flows, think about the, the geography of what we're trying to do, and, 
and to bring some of these ideas around biotechnology and textiles that are emerging through this kind of field of living textiles um, and start to map them. And so the Future Observatory project is based at the Design Museum in Lon London. And as a fellow, the, the idea is to really to, to develop them into more recognisable strategies and methodologies um, that we can share with the wider community. And just to finish, I did say at the beginning that um, the work that Living Textiles does, um, that we all do within our group, is very much collaborative and interdisciplinary. And I think the wonderful thing about being at the HBBE is that ability to work with such um, incredible scientists and engineers and designers in order to facilitate all these projects. So, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Uh, we have five minutes for questions if you would like to ask something. Huh? If not, I can maybe ask one question. Yeah. Uh, because you are collaborating, you are kind of like middle scale between biology and architecture. Uh, and I'm a little bit curious how, um, if the bi how the biology um, influences your design practice. Um, well, I think we've been really fortunate to have different approaches um, for different projects that we've worked on. So, to give the example of fibre highways, which um, Angie's going to present in a minute, there was quite, um, when, we, when we wrote that project, there was very much kind of um, a work package around the biology that we wanted to investigate, and then we thought about how we could then translate that up in scale using textiles. So... I think we were able to use kind of both a design methodology and kind of an experimental scientific methodology and just bring them together through the work that we did. So that would, that's one approach. Um, I think some of the prototyping has been really interesting because actually all the expertise has been in, involved right from the beginning. And so I think we've kind of developed our own methods um, through, that, through that process rather than, I guess, either tagging design on at the end or... or tagging the science on the end, it's really been integrated right from the beginning. I think that's, yeah, we've been very fortunate with the project. Uh, hello. <coughs> so I don't know, maybe it's too technical for the year, but um, me, I'm interested by uh, um, oxetic structure, so like anisotropy, because uh, you can uh, change uh, the local uh, deformation so I don't know if you have uh, exploited this uh, sort of uh, possibility with textile or other things, because you show uh, this beam that it's uh, limited. This is just topology, it's not uh, oxetic structures. Um, so with OU, is that in reference to the modular knitted architectures? Yeah, um, to be f that, that project is very much emerging. So we, w we started with the beam and we were starting with thinking about what component could we look at from both a fabric perspective so that we could make and test and then also from the modelling perspective. So actually it would be really interesting to talk to you about where we could take that in the future because I think what we're, what we're doing now with some of the, yeah, the script is looking at how they move but, not, but from that having that original component in mind. So absolutely it's, it's an early stage piece that one but it would be really interesting to talk about that further. Mm. I think she's got the mic then. Oh. Uh, sorry, what, what is your big biggest challenges and successes in applying biology into scalable architectures? I mean, I think, I think scale is obviously the question. It's, all, it's, the, it's, the, um, it's the nub of, of the issue. And I think what we can do with textiles is think about scale in, um, in a more staged way. So we can think about where where to engage particular bio, you know, aspects of biology, so whether that's working with bacteria and looking right down at that fibre scale and then think about how we can translate it back up again through fibres, yarns, fabrics, kind of working up through the scale. Um, or think about um, knit as a large-scale making technique. So I think what was really successful in BioKnit is that we had this industrial 
knitting equipment that could actually produce really large scale 3D panels on, and pieces. Um, and we were able to kind of work with those machines. I mean, obviously, to take it to the next scale, if we were to stick with industrial knitting, we would need a bigger machine with a wider needle bed. And we do, at every level, there are kind of limits to, to the um, to scale we can work at. But I think maybe there's the opportunity to overcome those through the technology. So, yeah, to, to kind of move the techniques we're looking at up, maybe we just need an enabling technology. One more question. I come to you. Hi. Um, my question is, do you experiment with different um, fibers or you just sat with like cotton or wool? Um, so, yes, I experiment with different fibers and actually we're starting to look at whether we can biosynthesize fibers as well. So really change the classes of fibers we're working in. Um, what I would say is I do try and look at kind of some look at principles when I'm thinking about fibres. So if I can use UK wool, I would prefer to do that. If I could use UK wool from maybe um, coarse wool varieties, which actually have very little um, commercial value within conventional knitting industry, then I would absolutely try and use those. So I think, you know, there's... Yes, you can get a range of different fibres, but I think it is important to kind of think about the responsibility and the kind of fibre classes that you're using. So the predominant um, fibres I would use are UK wools and then EU linens, so looking at linens and hemp. Does it change the interaction between bacteria and the fibres when you use the fibre? I think um, I might actually wait on that question because I think you might get the answer to that question um, when um, Angela uh, speaks next, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we will find um, the answer to the previous question from Angela Sherry. Um, she's an, <coughs> an environmental molecular microbiologist interested in the function and community composition of microfibers in the environment. Her strand of research within the hub sits within the micro microbial environmental theme and aims to decipher microbiomes of the built environments to ascertain which microbes are there. Microbiome characterization, how, mi how many microbiomes are, micro microbes are there, microbi microbial quantification, what role the microbes are playing, microbial function, and how microbes move, micro microbial translocation and interact in relation to human health and well-being. Sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> there were so many difficult words. Maybe <laughs> you can explain them. <laughs> Please. Well, thanks for your introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Angie Sherry again. <laughs> um, and I've been working with Jane, who needs no introduction. Um, she's fantastically organized this event. And it really, the project I'll present today, Fibre Highways, really brings in Jane's passion in textile technology and material science with my passion in microbial ecology or molecular microbiology. So we um, applied for and secured this um, Fibre Highways funding through the Environmental Biotechnology Network in 2020. So in the middle of, of, a pan, of the pandemic, which um, was interesting, given that this was a brand new collaboration between myself and Jane. So really, the, um, within the environmental biotechnology remit, we um, proposed this idea of fibre highways to look at material microbe interactions specifically for the application of hydrocarbon pollution bioremediation. So we really wanted to investigate the movement and the dispersal of microbes on both natural and synthetic fibres to try and uh, enhance hydrocarbon biodegradation. Um, we thought about sort of potentially novel ways of processing waste within the environment using both textiles and microbes. And, and um, we really... <laughs> interested in developing Sorry, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we're gonna do a new zoom thing. with the okay. password which just and performance in okay i'm sorry for that 
Um, is it someone? Yeah, Gear crashing? Yeah, yeah, we've got a troll. Password yeah. in, so people just can it in there. Um, but we will share that with the online audience. Feel free to continue. Okay. Sorry for that. That's okay. These things happen. So yeah, we really wanted to try and develop environmentally responsive biotextile hybrid systems, which Jane has just um, gave an overview of in, in her. So the sort of flow of the talk today, I'm going to talk about fungal highways. So what are they? So it's basically bacterial translocation along fungal mycelium. And that was really where the ideas for fibre highways came from, this previous research, which I'll show in just a second. Um, I'll talk about fibre highways, so the follow-on from fungal highways really, um, so bacterial translocation along textile fibres, and then the use of textiles as scaffolds, so mycelium interactions with textiles, and um, finally, so the, the fibre highways research has led on to further funding, so we've been looking recently at spore deposition on textiles as well. I'll try this. Hmm. Can I put this back into presenter mode? That will help. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, what are fungal highways? So, they're basically bacteria can actively use the, the liquid film which surrounds mycelium of the fungus um, for translocation. So, So basically, in the image on the right-hand side, you can see this white shadow which surrounds the fungal mycelium. And um, that's basically a liquid layer. And on the, the video on the right-hand side, you can see um, that the, the bacterial communities can use this liquid film to, um, to basically move around the fungal mycelium. And this has been shown to be really... Um, sort of useful within the world of hydrocarbon bioremediation. So you would have the fungal mycelium, say, pushing through a soil, and the bacteria are then able to come and use the liquid layer on the fungal mycelium, and you'll get this dual attack of the fungi and the, uh, the bacteria against the hydrocarbon within the natural environment. So the first phase of fibre highways was really just to recreate the work of previous researchers who looked at fungal highways. So this was to develop our approaches on confocal microscopy. So again, in an oil-free system, um, we were able to show that you get the bacteria, this motile strain of bacteria, moving around the fungal mycelium in an oil-free system. And we didn't lose any activity when we added a hydrocarbon to the, to the media we were also able to show that we get these, um, the bacteria moving on these fungal highways, as they've been termed, um, in an oil amended system as well. So moving from, so the, the sort of first phase would develop the methods and um, using the, the previous fungal highway research, we, we started to think about whether the microstructure of fibres would have any influence on the movement or the translocation of bacteria around these different fibres. So um, we, we looked at five different types of, of fibres, so wool, flax, or linen, silk, nylon and polyester. We just done some basic bacterial cell deposits onto the fibres and we were able to show that in both wool and fibres, just as examples, we've done the other fibres as well that uh, the microstructure did not appear to influence the deposition of bacteria on the surface of the fibres. So this again was informing us that in the next steps, the sort of scales on the wool structure wouldn't, wouldn't interfere with the translocation of the bacteria around the, um, the fibres. So this was our very first sort of preliminary evidence that silk may be able to act as a fibre highway. So if you remember... Um, with the fungal highway, you have this water layer surrounding the fungal mycelium and the bacteria can travel around the, the mycelium with that. In the same way, on the epifluorescence um, image on the, the right-hand side here, 
you can see the silk microfiber with this water layer around it and then you've got these um, fluorescently stained Pseudomonas putida cells which appear to be forming a network or a highway around that silk microfiber and again here at the bottom of the, the image. We then went on to show that we could also see this motile strain of bacteria transfocating around polyester, um, linen and nylon. And we're at the stage now where we basically want to particle track the bacteria and do a comparison between the different fabrics. So as Jane mentioned, in parallel with all of the sort of really um, small scale microscopy work, we were also looking at the design side using larger pieces of fabric. And again, Jane has showed some of these images, but we were really interested in whether mycelium could use uh, the textiles as a scaffold. And indeed, these amazing images from Jane show that that was possible. She'd done some of these in a home studio during COVID and then the HBBA workshop once that was back up and running. And then, again, Jane showed this video, <laughs> Stole My Thunder. <laughs> um, we also wanted to show, or to sort of look into these environmentally responsive textiles. So Jane used the programmable knit um, and, show, and produced these uh, materials that you can see in the video there, which changed their form in response to moisture addition. We were also interested because of the application of hydrocarbon sort of degradation and, and clean up in surface area. So the, the bottom image here on the, on the right shows sort of larger surface area on the outsides of the, the textile with a core in the middle where we were thinking it could have mycelium and hydrocarbon degrading bacteria. So the surface area would draw in the oil and then we'd have this active sort of core of um, biodegradation occurring. We've also moved on to look at spore deposition at a range of different scales, so the fibre, the yarn and the, the fabric scale. So spores are slightly different from vegetative bacterial cells, these are dormant. But again, on polyester this time as an example, we can see that the spores seem to deposit around a layer, um, sort of a, a water film that's around the outside of the fibres. <laughs> um, and if we do a little bit of droplet shape analysis, this was investigating the deposition of droplets of spores on the different fabric surfaces to, to sort of assess whether spores might deposit in a different manner to sort of other um, aqueous phase or solutions without any spores in them. So we had these nice um, images of a side view of the droplet going directly onto the fabrics and then an aerial view as well. So really nice visuals which can be distilled down into really boring graphs on the right hand side, which also gives us some information about sort of how quickly the rate of droplet spread. And there wasn't any differences between spores versus no spores, but there's definitely some differences between the different fabrics which gives us an idea about some of the surface properties, so hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity, so water-loving or water-hating repellency. We can also use the same fabrics to, um, that we've used for the droplet shape analysis to look at... Um, what's this doing? <laughs> to look at, yeah, again, spore deposition across the fabrics. So we can drop on two microliters, very small volumes of spore containing in the blue or without spores in the orange there and visualise these under blue light, which again shows the deposition of the spores on the different fabrics. So cotton shows the largest spots and spread of the spores. Polycotton has the brightest spots. So that's the most concentrated sort of deposition of spores that we've seen. The spore concentration was the same across all of the fabrics. And then polyester shows this smallest spots and least uniform spot distribution, and that can be to do with the, the different compositions of the fabrics as well. And moving on, um, we can also take those pieces of materials with the spores dropped onto them and, and look at those under the epifluorescence microscope, where we can 
get some sense of where those spores are depositing within the different fabrics um, compared to a control without spores. So yeah, really, um, just a summary. So the fungal highways, yeah, we, we saw that they occur in the presence of crude oil. So there's uses certainly in bioremediation for some of these biotechnologies. The microstructure of the fibres didn't have an effect on the influence of deposition of bacteria run at the surfaces of the fibres. We've got evidence of fibre highways on linen, silk and nylon. Um, and we're building up this body of knowledge of spore deposition as well through the fibre, yarn and fabric scale. I didn't show any of the yarn images, but yeah, we also have those. And we're really building up a body of evidence of microbe material actions. So I've shown mycelium textiles, bacteria textiles and spore textile interactions. And of course, going back to scale, which has been mentioned a few times, we are at the, the sort of micro scale with a lot of this work. And there will be projects presented over the course of the two days on sort of much larger applications, which are much more relevant to architecture. I've mentioned the sort of environmental applications as I've went through the talk, but obviously this, there's some worth within architecture and the built environment of mixing both the microbiology with the textiles. There's some um, applications within the medical fields, so living wound dressings going forward, so the transmission of beneficial microbes using clothing or textiles. And within biodesign, we're sort of just starting to think about targeted biodegradation of mixed blends of textiles to sort of biodegrade certain areas and create a new design from a previous design. And that just remains for me to acknowledge Jane and Prakiti and Dawn who helped out with the spore deposition study too. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Angela. Lots of stuff. Such an <laughs> yeah, such an interesting material. Thank you, Angela. Uh, a really fascinating talk there. Um, I, I've got two questions. Um, the first is related to. Um, in terms of the dispersal of the bacteria against um, the mycelium or other fibers, do you see other more complex dynamics occurring? So, for example, I'm thinking in the literature, particularly in, um, uh, in interaction with mycelium, you can get chemotaxis, um, where bacteria becomes attracted because the mycelium is secreting uh, an ethanol precursor. Um, do you have other kind of um, interesting dynamics that happen with some of the uh, non-living fibres? Um, have you observed any of them? And, and the second question is, what, uh, can, can you tell us what fungal species you're working with? Mm -hmm. So for the first question, I'm really interested in the chemotaxis as well. Um, so fibre highways was really about the translocation, but I think it would be really key to take some of the exudates from the fungal mycelium and look at what metabolites or the bacteria are sort of drawn to within that system, where they're moving to, or they're moving to a particular chemical, or they're moving away from it. So that's something that I'd like to sort of consider in future or try and, try and find funding for in the future. Um, the species of fungi that we looked at was Cunningamella elegans and Pleurotus ostriatus, so those two. We specifically chose one of them because it was known soil fungus and because the application of the funding was originally for hydrocarbon biodegradation, we thought that that would make the most sense in, in that context. And was that everything I did answer? Thank yeah. you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm quicker here. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, I really love the overall uh, context of the fiber highways where we didn't like didn't uh, get a scope to see like how highways can work for the bacteria as well. I was interested in knowing the fact that uh, how have you stepped across with uh, with respect to the thermal uh, conditions for the fibers where uh, like in inducing a certain temperature on a certain segment of a fabric 
how the fibers are distorting the connections or are they leading even more uh, connection for the movement of the bacteria? So change in the properties. Yeah, with respect see, like, to temperature. With, we haven't done that yet. Another very good idea, which I'll be writing down, applying for. <laughs> yeah, no, we haven't done that yet. But um, temperature is a, is a big, big driver of microbial communities in the environment and, and lots of studies. So I'm sure that it would have an effect on, on the, the highways that, that we're seeing, yeah. But, yeah. And now we have the next speaker, um, Emily Birch. Uh, Emily, she's a PhD candidate at Newcastle University in the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape, where she's investigating the potential for harnessing moisture-sensitive bacterial spores into responsive hybrid living smart materials for application in the built environment. Um, hi, um, thank you very much for having me here today and thank you everybody who's done so much to put this on, um, it's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to have a quick touch on some of the recent developments I've had with bacterial spore hygromorphs. Um, I'm going to start with a quick look at the drive behind my research. I know a lot of you will be very familiar with everything that's going on in the climate crisis, so I don't want to spend too long on this. But I do want to highlight a few things. So obviously the climate crisis is having a massive impact and we need to be doing everything we can to reduce that. Um, and there have been quite a few schemes to that end, um, such as the Energy Performance of Buildings Initiative, uh, Directive sorry, in 2002, um, the Paris Agreement from 2015, um, and more recently the outcome from COP26, which is the Glasgow Climate Pact. These have all been fantastic, but they haven't quite achieved as much as they'd hoped. Um, and the, the question is why, um, and it really is the million pound question, um, and I'm not at all going to suggest one answer, because uh, I don't think there is one. Um, but I do want to have a look at the individual contributing factors towards why this is happening. Um, so I just want to have bring your attention here down to this graph um, and see the fact that the energy input for space cooling is still increasing where other areas are decreasing. Um, and the issue, the reason why that is, is because it's, it's a hybrid issue. It includes the energy required for uh, maintaining the relative humidity as well through the process of space cooling. Um, and if this summer is anything to go by, uh, this is only going to become a bigger and more important issue. So why do we want to um, help control relative humidity above and beyond just the impact on emissions and costs. Well, it has a lot of impacts. Um, so un um, unchecked relative humidity um, makes it a lot harder to manage our temperature control because it acts as a buffer. Um, it causes a lot of structural issues, so damp, um, has massive impact on our buildings. Um, it can also promote um, fungal growth, viral proliferation, and even issues like COVID have been um, enhanced by that. Um, so we need to find a successful relative humidity control, which doesn't, I think I keep knocking my microphone, um, which doesn't keep adding to the issue by requiring and being a massive energy guzzling system. And if we can do that, there's a suggestion that we can reduce that energy input for space cooling by 20%. Um, yeah, so this, this is a schematic that I put together, just doing a quick review of the current relative humidity control mechanisms that we've got. Um, and I'm not going to spend ages on it, but the conclusion of it was if we want to try and produce a passive system, we need to start looking at things like active materials and ideally one that's naturally occurring. Um, so this brings me to hygromorphs. Um, and hygromorphs are nature's naturally occurring um, relative humidity sensing material. Um, they shrink and swell in response to water and they can vary on that sensitivity depending on the type of hygromorph. Um, there are plenty that you'll be familiar with, uh, specifically Jane and Angio just mentioned linen, um, which has, again, that same mechanism. Um, so the cracking in dried soil, um, wood, and specifically what I'm looking at is bacterial spores. Um, and there's a few reasons why I'm looking at those. Um, so because each cell is identical, um, you can produce homogeneous material, which can make things like programming that material much easier. Um, whereas, say, for instance, wood has a grain pattern, which you have to contend with. Um, also, they're incredibly robust um, and they have a very fast response time, which is great for what we're hoping to use them for. So we know we want to use bacterial spores. So first we've got to grow some bacteria. Um, and 
this is, um, so what we do is we set off an LB culture of the Cytilis bacteria, um, and that's a commonly occurring soil bacteria. And we allow it to grow um, into its exponential phase. And as you can see here, um, this is a microscope image of um, spores which are stained um, with a specific stain which highlights the living spores in red, and sorry, the living bacteria in red and the spores in blue green. Um, and what we do is we gently um, restrict the nutrients um, and that causes the, spore, the bacteria to sporulate. And you can see this process here. So once we've got the spores, um, we need to harness that expansion and contraction into something that's potentially more useful for us in an architectural sense um, and turn it into, um, you know, harness it through a bilayer so we can get a bending response from it. Um, so this is a formation of what I term an actuator, um, and I'll use this term all the way through, so I thought it'd be important to mention this here. Um, how we form that is we have an inert substrate layer, um, and then we bind the spores to the top surface of that uh, using bacterial glue. So we use our latex for the inert substrate, and then we've got spores on top. So just keep that in mind as I go through. So... When I initially started looking at this material, um, we were trying to gain a little bit of an idea of how we can control it. Um, and the first thing we did was having a look at um, changing the concentration of spores we used to make the actuator. And as you can see here on this image, you want this? Yeah. Um, as you increase the concentration of spores, you increase the deflection angle, which is great. Um, and then we had a look to see if how, how strong they are. You know, can they lift masses? Um, and as you can see in the video, um, that's lifting little paper masses, which are 150% of the actuator's own mass. Um, so that's all pretty cool, uh, but it's still very rudimentary um, and really wanted to push it further and gain a little bit more understanding and control over it. Um, so what we did is then have a look at changing the shape of the actuator. Um, and that again had an impact on what deflection we got, um, but we couldn't necessarily predict it exactly. Um, so much like you would score in origami, we started then etching the surface of the latex to pre-program which way you're gonna get that deflection. And as you can see here, we could program a tube or a twist or a curl deflection, depending on which orientation that etching's in. Um, and from there, it was a bit of a case of have a play with it further. Can we, can we achieve a bend by a committee for fold instead of a bend um, by narrowing those etching patterns and using our spore placement just on those bend points. Um, and as you can see here, we had a little bit of a play with some very basic self-assembly, um, which worked really nicely. So we have sort of building up our palette of variables, um, which we can use to control it. And the final one I want to talk about is latex thickness. Um, so hopefully the slide worked. Oh, it was going to work. No. Hopefully videos were. Um, basically, what this is showing is much like with controlling this, the concentration of the spores by changing the, um, I'm not sure this is running as it should do. One minute. Hopefully that will if they don't, you can imagine it. Basically, as you go through your thicknesses of your latex, you start with a 0.2, um, we work up to 0.35, 0.4 and 0.5. And as you increase that thickness of the latex, you then decrease the deflection angle. So it's the same thing, but in the other way around. Um, so, oh gosh. So the trick is, is then we really want to quantify those results. We don't want to just look at the, you know, lovely videos. Um, we want to actually have an idea of really, can we use this as a tool for controlling it? And as I said there, it's a negative linear correlation, um, which, um, yeah, which means we can, we can use it. Um, it's got a three star significance on that data, which is really helpful as far as um, how predictable it is. Um, so then what we wanted to do was then take that a little bit further bought this to show you all, um, is we wanted to be able to take it so that you could turn that bending into something a little bit more useful. Um, and so we what we did is combine them together through aggregation and clamp them together between these and other panel. Um, so we've got six actuators, which produce then an aperture. And then from those apertures, we can then start to record the open area um, and get a bit more of an idea about how, on an architectural sense, it might start you know, feeling within your environment. So this is then how we analyze this. 
So here you've got um, an image trace of those open areas um, of those apertures as they open and close, starting with 0.2 at the top and down to the 0.5. Um, and when that's put on the graph, there's quite a few things that the more I looked at it, the more I realized you could take away from it. Um, there's a couple of things I want to mention. So the first thing here is where we've got this sort of uh, lull here at the start, but this lag time and where we're getting the response, that is to do with where the actual moisture is evaporating off the surface. Um, and that's why there's a delay in the response. And then we've got here, uh, which is this active zone where they're actually opening and closing. Um, and in this sense, they're all opening. Um, and as you'd expect, when we get towards the end of the graph, the 0.2 has opened the greatest amount, um, followed by successfully down to the 0.5. Um, the 0.2 has this crossover point here. And I think that is to do with the structural integrity of the latex. It's actually very flexible, very flimsy, and it actually drops shut once the spores stop contracting sufficiently. Um, and likewise, the 0.5 has a much longer active period. And I think that is to do with the fact that that latex itself is a lot stiffer um, and it's a lot harder for it to move. But really what this came to was we've got a lot of different variables which produce a lot of different responses. Um, and I started building a catalog um, of where, what is the input and what is the output? Um, and it gives us the, you know, gives us the possibility to start building a very basic toolkit. Um, so you've got a bit more of an idea on how you could utilize the system. So on that sense, that is a panel made out of completely of category C, um, which is 0.4 latex with 16.6 microliters of spore, um, with no etching, triangular, et cetera, et cetera. And again, what you can see is we've tracked the open area. Um, and that is all of these, I should have mentioned, all of these are run from 100% relative humidity down to 50 um, and time through the process. So these is it's tracked at three minute points throughout that process. Um, now there's 27 apertures there. <coughs> Number 14 is highlighted. Um, I'm gonna talk about it on the next slide. Um, so as I said, because that panel was made out of completely all of one type, we can look at the inter and the intra um, variation within the system. Um, and if we look at the panel as a whole, um, combining all of the open areas together, get a bit of a sense of how it would work in situ um, and what the overall impact of that system might be. Um, and then if we look at the panel as for, so this is aperture 14 from the last slide, which was selected by a random number generator because I just wanted to bring it up to you showing how close the open area traces are. Um, so at minute zero, there's a little bit of variation between them. So each line here is each replicate. Um, and then at the middle point in the study, there's a little bit more variation. So that moving zone, that active zone has a little bit of give and take in it. But the really nice thing is by the time you get down to the end of the study, they've almost all lined up again, um, almost exactly, which is brilliant as far as saying, will it or won't it do its job? Um, so yeah, so then this just brings me to my last slide, which is where I hope maybe the future of it will go. Um, as, as the you know, toolkit is expanding, maybe we can build those panels, which are fantastic for a one system approach, um, build it into something that's maybe a bit more modular in design. Um, and you could say, build a bespoke panel, which might suit your system or your room or your space. So if you've got the kettle on one side, you can have something that's a bit more responsive over there and over towards the windows, it's a little bit less responsive. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Emily, the people. Um, is it a reversible system? Or is it a constant with them? Yeah, yeah. So, very much reversible. It very happily goes one way or the other. Um, there's been studies where people have run them quite a few times. Um, most I've run them through is 10 times. Um, there is a bit of variation through the first couple of cycles. Um, so they actually tend to increase in their deflection from the first and second cycle. Um, the, when you first make them, it's almost like they haven't calibrated themselves properly. Um, and the spores all seem to align better on the second and third cycle through a humidity environment. Um, but yeah. So quick question. Yep. Was it actually the spore absorbing the water or the concentration of the spores increasing the surface area? So the spores themselves are microscopic. So yes, they may increase the surface area through undulations, but I don't think that's likely cause of it, considering 
the structure of a spore is um, you know, imagine this little sphere, um, and in the center, it's got the, what would you consider the nucleus. Um, and around that center, you've got um, a peptidoglycan layer, um, which is basically like a sponge, and that is the bit that absorbs the water and therefore expands. Um, so that that is the bit that causes the shape change. So when you've got, imagine like a, a ball, a, you know, pool of marbles. If all those marbles expand by a minute amount, you'll get an overall shape change. And because it's then trapped in that bilayer, that's what then creates the, the overall change, much like a uh, biomechanic strip would. Um, so yeah, so I think that's probably more likely. Thank you. Awesome. Um, has this, do you ever think about the spore as developing? Yes, so that is, a uh, really good question. Um, the, there's two ways to look at it. The way I work with the spores is I work with the, the naturally occurring wild type. Um, so they haven't been genetically modified at all. So if you were to do, introduce nutrients and moisture into the environment, they would then turn back into viable bacteria. So the system I'm currently working with, yes, that is a very real issue. There are genetically modified versions of the bacteria that I work with where that phase has been cut, they can't then return back to being a viable bacteria. And I think if you were going to use this in in situ, that would be the easiest answer to that question. Um, the other answer is actually the type of nutrients that you need are likely to be uncommon in an internal environment, um, but not impossible. Um, so my answer would be, if I had the choice to work with the GM version, I would. With the latex that you because yeah, very good question again. Um, so yes, I use the natural version. Um, actually, the red latex that I showed in the videos here is um, not fully natural. It's a bit of a, col um, a combination. And it was bought from a different supplier. Um, and I had ideally wanted everything to be the same. Yes, the natural latex does break down um, and it breaks down within three or four years. Um, it's it's a sustainable material, which is part of the reason why I want to use it, but also the spores are quite fickle in who they want to make friends with um, and getting them to stick to surfaces is quite difficult. Um, and because the natural latex has got that little bit more undulation in its surface, it makes it much easier to, to attach to. But I have looked into things like silicon um, or even 3D printed materials, which are flexible as well. Um, and I think there's definitely an avenue to look down there um, if you wanted something that was going to last Longer than your three or four years latex would. Um, I really think it's a brilliant project and really enjoyed the presentation. I have a question about um, how you thought of the material um, folding and movement depending on the um, surface, uh, let's say, um, material presence. Did you think or did you try to make like a material with the material directly inside and to maybe understand if the folding or all the movement could be possible? Yeah, so it, it is definitely something I'd love to look into. Um, it's the, the thought of having one material, you know, a one pot solution to this, you know, material would be amazing. Um, I think there's a couple of a couple of things I would be wary of trying to do that, um, which is part of the reason why I haven't looked into them right right yet, is um because the uh, spores themselves are really very responsive to relative humidity. I think if they were trapped within a material, it might be difficult for the, the moisture sensitive to actually penetrate through the material. So it would have to be a very porous material to start with. Um, and then I would say, I think it doesn't like me, does it? Um, and then I would say the other thing is, is um, that material would have to be um, fabricated in a certain sense that wouldn't damage the spores. So the spores are very robust. Um, but they don't like being under high pressure for long periods of time. Um, and one of the things I'd really wanted to look into was um, sort of 3D printing with them as such, which could be amazing, you know, a, a combined system where you've got your substrate and your, your spore printed at the same time. Um, and I would love to be able to do that. Um, unfortunately, current 3D printers on the market don't fit the bill. Um, and it, it was something during COVID when I was sat at home and I wasn't able to get into the lab. I did look into, could I, you know, hash my own one? I'm not the greatest with computers. So I backed down on that front. Um, but yeah, no, it would be amazing to do something like that. But the fabrication just isn't quite there yet. 
Hello everyone, uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, thank you, the research group of Living Textiles and SBB for this amazing opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'm an alumni from Biotech Design. My name is Mangesh Kurul, and uh, my I've worked with these amazing people as co-authors, uh, Brenda Parker, Annette, Alex, and Marcus Cruz for this exciting project, uh, Biochroma Hydrogel Composite Plasters. Uh, the term biochroma comes from an interesting aspect of an observation uh, at the subway, which is very personal to me, where uh, where they have been like mistreated or ill-treated over these years, where but they have an exciting expression to share with respect to the coloration, with with respect to the conditions around on the walls. So this this particular segment of a photograph talks about the the, the dampness, the dryness, and the semi-dryness of the walls, where the algae uh, are growing uh, or the biofouling is happening. And the interesting part was to observe that how these expressions can be seen in a controlled manner or how can these be seen as a bioesthetic vision towards it. There, in the past, there have been many uh, designers who've tried this uh, and uh, immobilizing algae onto buildings, uh, not just for, uh, for aesthetic purpose, but also their uh, capacity to sequester carbon and remediate water from the, for, for, uh, remediate the toxic metals from the water. So uh, the most uh, significant element out of these uh, projects have been hydrogels, which have been commonly used to encapsulate these algal cells inside the material and then adhere to the surface. But uh, with, the, with the overuse of these hydrogels with, within the coming time, they, these are the biopolymers. So they, they have also led to a lot of uh, drastic uh, effects like they have factors which limit the performance or the capacity of the material, especially with respect to the capacity of the material and uh, then the, the, on, on the, the poor properties of shape retention on dehydration is, is uh, missing, as well as the, uh, the viability of the cells on encapsulation decreases with time. So this led to a research question that how do we make a material that is biocompatible, structurally stable, castable, retain shape and on dehydration? But the most important time is like, how do we allow algal cells to colonize the surface of the material over the time without dehydration and without encapsulation? So uh, this coming towards this research question, it tackled into like three important segments of biology, aesthetics and architectural surfaces where aesthetics is one of the important segment that I triggered or uh, I highlighted within the whole uh, pool of research, where uh, architectural surface and aesthetics needed a material that would allow this uh, algae to grow on it, where, where, where it can become substrate to allow the growth and provide all the necessary conditions that it needs to be alive, that it needs to, to colonize over the time. Furthermore, there were like these interesting bricks. I collaborated with my project partner Arnav in, in an academic se segment where we had developed these uh, bricks. Uh, and uh, I was very curious to apply this material onto those bricks uh, to see that how does it work as a plaster and uh, since it was binding to the So, the, so uh, it, so yeah, so this right image is like the ones that have been tested on top of each other and the, it has been completely covered with the plaster. Uh, 
And once the setup was ready, the calcium chloride water, which is used as a toxicating agent, was upcycled and allowed to circulate throughout the desolated models. And uh, after the cross linking was done, a time lapse was recorded with photographic imaging on a, a period of three hours intervals, uh, where Pocodium Pocodium, the same species that was tested before for the biocompatibility, was allowed to circulate throughout the material. Uh, and then uh, the circulation was stopped for the to enhance the or to initiate the dehydration process so that it could induce its coloration uh, over the period of time. And this was the overall setup towards the second side of the world setup. That's all the different day position. So uh, this algae to, in the bottom of the container is allowed to circulate outside with a hydroponic pump or maybe a parasitic pump and then allowed to uh, flow towards the surfaces. And the fibers, the, the, the soft, rough surface, uh, uh, roughness of the uh, substrate allows the uh, adherence of the material, uh, adherence of the biofilm species. And at the same time, uh, it, it is biocompatible. So on hydration, it constantly provides uh, conditions for it to grow. Uh, this is an interesting video which talks about the expansion and contraction of the fibers present in the material. So this has also this tone of expression, not with just aesthetics, but but the capacity or the uh, or, or the way it surprises the viewers and when the, there is a slight expansion that happens uh, on hydration. Yeah, these are some of the images, and this is that uh, uh, laser cut acrylic board on which the whole setup is resting, which allows the cooperation of the algae and the water together to run down back to the uh, culture media or the container. And uh, during that whole process, uh, uh, I photographed it in, in different aspects where I wanted to show how how uh, expressive the overall setup can be or the overall project can be. Uh, which is also made from the same algae that is growing on the walls. So that, that's altogether a different perspective looking at it. And then this EPS generating corporeal corporeal has these tiny biofilms which also adheres to the elements that are used in the setup, uh, which, which also on dehydration induces this pink color. So since they are part of the hydrated uh, controlled environment. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude where uh, there was an interesting uh, 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 segment of adding uh, the uh, uh, another species of Eritrea onto the material, which showed the possibility of co culture and multiculture at its uh, at its potential onto the material. So this this brings up to uh, an interesting communication with the with the diversity around it, the way the species grow naturally on the walls. What happens when we relink it from an aesthetic, from a designer's perspective of how aesthetics can be seen at a multi range of diversity of species? And what would these biofilms, not just with respect to chrome or with respect to coloration, can uh, allow for different types of applications? Yeah, and this is the direct conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So we're talking about on high system for 75 and 75, like the bacterial of sediment, the natural one, so they it will all grow in the population. Yeah. Uh so uh so in my year one, so this I so the course was biotech design. So in so in my year one, I like uh explored a lot, experimented a lot with bacterial cellulose, and to be honest. This was the realization by working with different types of materials that 
we are missing this substrate material that would feed all these uh, aspects of uh, of uh, strengthening or allowing the biocompatibility. Uh, in integrating Bupa onto bacterial cellulose is, is an interesting concept altogether. However, I'm uh, I'm a bit curious to like I was also a bit skeptical on the fact that the contamination that would happen on uh, on add, adding a lot of acidic nature to the material like Bupa. So this is something still uh, a thought to be uh, considered on using or integrating it together. But hydrogels in order uh, allow a better uh, a better way to integrate fibers because they encapsulate the, the, that encapsulating strategy is uh, in itself is uh, is very much uh, uh, beneficial or very much productive compared to just the bacterial cellulose film altogether. Anyone else? Some last questions? <laughs> Uh, like how does conversation yeah. happen? Yeah. So basically, uh, it's it's because of the algae. So for Korean for Korean has these uh, it's known for like EPS generating cyanobacteria or marine algae, where it 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 uh so when it grows, it it produces the biomass it has a lot of EPS, which is completely loaded with phycocerithine pigments, which is a natural chemical altogether. And this is the same chemical that's being used in the cosmetic industry by harvesting the biomass. So uh, in here, we are completely, uh, we are completely separating it from a commercial link, but allowing a complete natural way of synchronizing to aesthetic. So uh, just on dehydrating phoporium, you would get that pink coloration over the period of time. Yeah, this color is completely natural. It's due to the algae. Sorry. Yeah, so basically this material just, just acts as a substrate to allow different growth. So it could be another types of bacteria uh, uh, so could be an interesting one. I haven't tested on different types of bacteria that I've just worked with algae. But yeah, multiple coloration can be a possibility. Like uh, the Nalila Salina algae is known for amazing amount of carotene pigmentation, uh, which ranges from orange to pink based on the salinity levels and light intensity levels. So if it would be used as a biomass that has been just applied over the material and the material. Helps in providing the necessary survival condition, it can be very much helpful for that. So, of achieving good coloration band. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.